um, and before she went back to the US to join the JWST program at that time. Before that, Aswara had done her PhD at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics uh, in Bangalore, uh, and then gone as a postdoc to work at the Carnegie Observatories in the US, and it worked um, uh, after that um, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where she now is, um, on Hubble Space Telescope matters, some of the, the greatest surveys that one hears about, the good survey and, 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 and things like that, uh, and before joining Ayuka as faculty, and, and we were just talking about how in the, um, uh, in the, at the time when she was here, um, she took part in person in the science, the activities um, in, in, in various forms. And, and it's wonderful to have her back. Uh, and, and not just that, but have her back as an insider um, to the happenings with the James Webb Space Telescope, which of course is uh, um, giving us completely new surprises every day in the last few weeks as it literally unfolded in space and i love the word use of the word unfolding in the titles for i had there um in space to form the whole telescope and and now it has started sending data swara over to you and we are really um looking forward to your talk well thank you very much Shomak. thanks for the introduction and uh, i want to wish everybody a very happy national science day um, this is really the opportunity to, you know, build up your interest and ambition to pursue science. Uh, so welcome to everybody. Uh, so yes, so we're going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, and it's really a pleasure to be giving this talk on the Science Day. Okay, so okay, let's hope this slides proceed. Okay, so, so the real uh, excitement about the Webb Telescope is we're trying to push the frontiers of space astronomy here. And the Webb Telescope is NASA's largest and most powerful space telescope. Uh, it's, it was envisioned as a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope that we all know and love. Uh, we already know that for about three decades now, the Hubble Space Telescope has been providing us with amazing images of the universe, and it has expanded our knowledge in many ways in many areas, uh, understanding a lot more about star forming galaxies, star forming regions in our own Milky Way, um, uh, studying about black holes and so on. And James Webb is really our really pushing beyond what Hubble Space Telescope has been able to tell us. So to go beyond what Hubble has already shown us, uh, JWST focuses on a different uh, wavelength. It essentially looks at the long wavelength. It looks in the infrared. So Webb is actually our infrared eyes on the universe, whereas Hubble was mostly uh, you know, in the optical and in the ultraviolet. And also Hubble was uh, in an Earth-based orbit or surround, I mean, it was going around the Earth at a height of about 600 kilometers above the Earth, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope looks in the infrared, and there are reasons why we want it to be uh, located very far away from, uh, you know, objects like the sun and the earth, which uh, emit infrared radiation. So this telescope is in a solar orbit at a distance of about 1.5 million kilometers from the earth. Um, so Webb Telescope has been a long time in the making. It's been almost three decades. Uh, and come to think of it, uh, I have here an image uh, which is shown on the right here. This is essentially the cover of a proceedings of a workshop that was held at STSEI back in 1989, where they were already discussing the next generation space telescope. And Hubble hadn't even been launched by then. Hubble was launched in 1990. So even before that, people had started thinking about the next generation space telescope. So it's a continuation of NASA's legacy of great observatories in space. 
And also the thing I want to highlight is, you know, whenever you have these long projects that take a long time, um, it's really taking advantage of all the innovation and the new technology that come along. And you really need to take technology uh, and all the innovation in detector technology or in instrumentation, you need to take that hand in hand in order to advance science and to enable new discoveries. And of course, uh, so that after a long wait of about three decades and having about 1,200 scientists and engineers working on this project, the Webb Telescope launched on December 25th uh, last year, almost like a Christmas gift. Um, and the Christmas tree that you see on the left side is actually my Christmas tree. Uh, I mean, that's what I was, you know, watching um, as I was watching the launch. I mean, this was really my living room. Uh, so, of course, it was a fantastic, beautiful, very successful launch, uh, with all optimal, uh, you know, meeting all the conditions that we needed, the right amount of thrust, uh, and a perfect launch in many ways. Uh, so, of course, after that, you know, um, there's been a successful launch and then the deployment is also uh, was very successful. Uh, and right now we are actually getting the telescope ready to uh, give us science images. So before I really go into the science that Web can do, I want to take a step back, uh, particularly for the young people in the audience, uh, to really understand why is it that we have to launch telescopes in space? So here, uh, here is an illustration with the uh, image of a galaxy, NGC 3370. Uh, on the left side, you see an image that was taken with a 2.4 uh, uh, meter telescope on the ground. And on the right side, you see the same uh, field of view, but observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so the thing that you notice here is the amount of clarity, or it's almost like seeing the galaxy in high definition when you see the uh, Hubble images. And you can see also a lot of the fainter outer regions of the galaxy. You can even see structures in the galaxies that are in the background. So the problem really is that when we observe galaxies from the ground, uh, the Earth's atmosphere tends to blur the images of astronomical sources. This is because the plane wavefront that is actually coming from these very distant astronomical sources, they are getting distorted by the uh, different layers of the atmosphere which have turbulence in them. So that causes, that does not give us sharp images and that causes all of these images to kind of be a little blurred. So going to space essentially helps to get rid of that blurring that is caused by the Earth's atmosphere. Another reason why we want to launch telescopes in space is really to just access some of the wavelengths that you cannot access uh, from the ground. And that's what's illustrated in this figure here. So on the, um, on the vertical axis, what you see is really the height from the surface of the Earth, uh, you know, the height in the atmosphere, basically. And um, when you go from the left to the right, I'm essentially showing you uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum going from gamma rays to longer wavelengths, uh, radio waves. And what you see here, just looking at the length of those vertical uh, lines here, you can see that the gamma rays, the X-rays, and a large part of the ultraviolet rays essentially don't make it all the way to the surface of the Earth. They are absorbed at different heights in the atmosphere. Uh, but the visible window and the near ultraviolet and uh, the near infrared, part of the near infrared radiation can come all the way to the surface of the Earth. Again, there's a large part of the infrared radiation and the microwave radiation that essentially gets absorbed in the atmosphere. Then there is the radio waves that are transmitted all the way to the Earth. So pretty much unless you're studying objects in the optical window, or in the radio window, if you want to access the other wavelengths, you really need to um, you know, launch telescopes in space. Uh, so launching telescopes in space has been something that's been going on for many decades now. So uh, we know that the Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990 and is still operating uh, beautifully, and the light observed are in the ultraviolet visible and then the near infrared. And then there's a Chandra Observatory, which was launched in 1999, and it is going on uh, even now and is observing in the X-rays. And then you have the Spitzer Telescope, which was an infrared telescope, 
uh, and it was launched in 2003 and was decommissioned in 2020. Uh, that was again an infrared telescope, but a much smaller telescope. It only had a mirror that was like 85 centimeters. And also uh, closer to home, you know about the Astrosat uh, in, uh, that was launched by ISRO, again, observed mostly in X-ray and ultraviolet. And again, for the same reasons uh, of wanting to access these wavelengths, you had to launch it in space. So, um, so the, the question then is, so I've been talking about observing galaxies or observing the sky, astronomical sources in different wavelengths. So why do we really need to study objects in different wavelengths? Why not just study them in the optical and radio where you can easily set up telescopes on, on the ground? Um, so here is an image of the Antinae galaxy. Now this is a galaxy which is an interacting galaxy or you know, these are like two galaxies coming together uh, to close distances. And once they come very close, they begin to interact gravitationally. And in future, they may really merge into a one single galaxy. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here in this image is essentially the different view that you get when you look at uh, galaxies in different wavelengths. So you see the Chandra image which shows you the X-rays, um, you see the Hubble image that shows you the visible light, and then you see the Spitzer image, uh, which is in the infrared, and in that last panel, it's essentially a combination of all these images. So that is really the total picture of the galaxy. And you can see the different perspectives that you get when you look at these different wavelengths, right? If you just looked at any one of the wavelengths, you wouldn't really get a clear picture of what is going on in these uh, systems. And the reason, again, why they look so different in the different uh, wavelengths has to do with what is the emission that you're studying in these galaxies. Um, so I'm using galaxies as an example, but you know, I mean, the same is true also when you look in uh, star forming regions or even when you study the property of individual stars and so on. It really depends on what wavelength the emission is coming from and what is causing the emission. So when you look at this galaxy, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is very uh, common and very famous among amateur astronomers, because you can see it through a reasonably sized telescope, uh, you see uh, the different wavelengths have been separated out. And you see it in the Chandra, you see a lot of point sources and you see a little bit of diffuse emission. Now, Chandra is essentially probing the X-rays. So you're seeing very energetic radiation that is coming from regions around the black hole or from neutron stars. And the diffuse gas that you're seeing is mostly very hot gas. And if it's emitting in the X-rays, it means it's really hot. When we say hot, I'm talking about something like a million Kelvin uh, temperature for the gas. And then you have the Hubble image, and the Hubble image essentially shows you the uh, light emitted by stars, mostly like black body radiation. And then you can also have the glowing gas, which is basically ionized gas. And against the backdrop of this you know, light coming from stars and gas, you also see these dark lanes of dust. And that is because dust essentially absorbs the light that the stars and gas are emitting. And then you have the Spitzer infrared, now the infrared shows you the um, light coming from cooler stars, older stars, which have uh, a cooler temperature. And also you see some glow coming from the clouds of interstellar dust because dust can emit like a black body. And also there are certain emissions that come uh, from the dust itself. And then if you looked in the ultraviolet on the other hand, if you look in Galax image, uh, Galax was a satellite which was observing the ultraviolet, and the images from Galax essentially show you regions where very young massive stars are present, because if you think of their uh, light emission coming as a black body, then these are very hot stars, so their emission peaks in the ultraviolet, so that's the best wavelength to look at them. So I think I have impressed upon you the reason why we want to study uh, objects in uh, different wavelengths. So now going back to the Webb telescope, uh, on the entire electromagnetic spectrum, uh, this essentially shows you the um, range of wavelengths that, you know, the three uh, famous uh, space telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, and uh, Webb um, Telescope. So Hubble observed from 0.1 micron to about 2.5 micron wavelength. So that's mostly the UV and the visible. And the Spitzer Telescope, uh, which was an infrared telescope, observed from three microns to about 160 microns. 
And the James Webb Space Telescope will be observing in exactly in, in between. And it overlaps a little bit with the HST and a little bit with Spitzer. And James Webb observes all the way from 0.6 microns to about 28 microns. But remember that Webb is a much bigger telescope. And so it will be offering you very high resolution images in the infrared, which hasn't been done before. So why study objects in the infrared? Uh, so here is a, a quick illustration of you know, what you see through the infrared as opposed to seeing in the visible. So here you have this person who has his hands in this uh, black trash bag and uh, you cannot really see the hand in the visible because of course the trash bag obstructs, uh, you know, the light doesn't pass through it. But when you take an image in the mid-infrared or in the infrared, you actually see the hands because the bag is essentially, I mean, the infrared radiations can actually pass through and show you what's inside, um, inside what is being blocked by the visible light. Now, in astronomy, it's the same thing. So infrared light can pass through the dust and uh, reveal features that you would not usually see in the visible light. Now, I'm illustrating that with a really nice example here. So here is the one of the astronomical sources, the Carina Nebula, that was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a visible image. So this is a color composite, uh, which is obtained by combining images taken in different optical wavelength filters. And you can see this huge pillar of dust. Um, and uh, there's a lot of dust and gas, and you can see a little bit of glow coming from, uh, you know, from, from, from where, somewhere within these, uh, you know, pillars of gas and dust. And when you look at it, and so you know that there must be some kind of a bright source behind that is responsible for this glowing gas. And when you look in the infrared, just see how that image changes. And you begin to see this very red stars. And in one of the stars, you can even see the jet coming out uh, in the two perpendicular directions. So let's go back again. Uh, just see the stark difference between what you see in the visible light and in the infrared. So you can even see the number of stars that come up in the background uh, You know when, when I switch from this visible image going back again into the infrared. So I think with this illustration, I've kind of impressed upon you why it is important to look in the infrared and how uh, you, know, you can actually see through the gas and dust when you look in the infrared. So essentially, Webb will be able to peer into all of these uh, you know, dusty pillars of gas and reveal the stars behind them. And when you, but Webb not only observes in the near infrared, Webb also observes in the mid infrared. And the beauty about observing things in mid infrared is you can actually study emissions from the dust itself. So the, the dust can actually emit, uh, the dust and the gas clouds that surround the dust can uh, emit uh, you know, emission lines coming from some kind of, uh, you know, huge um, carbon molecules, uh, what we call the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And it can also uh, kind of the dust grains themselves can absorb light and then we radiate it in the infrared, just like black body, because essentially the dust is getting heated. And once you have a heated source like that, it can emit like a black body. So you get both continuum emission and you can get you know, specific uh, you know, emissions coming from uh, certain molecules. So the Webb telescope has instruments that can record both images and spectra of astronomical sources, but very high quality. So, um, so it can essentially split light, uh, you know, just like what happens in a rainbow or what you do with white light using a prism. Uh, you can essentially, um, you know, split it into its component, uh, you know, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red wavelengths. Uh, it's the same way the prism and the gratings that are present in the web telescope can split the infrared light into the infrared constituent wavelengths. And spectra are very important because they tell us information about galaxies, and stars, um, the images tell you what these galaxies or stars look like, where the emissions are coming from, uh, what the morphology or the structure of these emissions are. But when you have spectra, you get a lot of additional information. So there is the continuum light that is coming from the sources themselves, either because they're emitting like a black body or maybe they have a power law emission. It's a continuous uh, spectrum at all wavelengths. 
But then when this light passes through the gas in front of them, um, they can, if you're looking, if you're looking at a continuum source through the gas, then some of the gas, the elements that are present in the gas, the uh, molecules and atoms can absorb some of the radiation and you see absorption lines. On the other hand, you can have the gas itself glow because it's an ionized gas, in which case there are, uh, you know, there is ionizations and recombinations happening in the gas itself, and then you can get emission line spectrum. That's when you get all your bomber lines and, you know, Lyman lines and so on. So there are similar lines that are visible in the uh, infrared, so we will be able to see those emission lines. And not only can you tell what the, uh, you know, galaxies are made of, you can also understand the motion of gas and dust in the galaxies. Uh, you can look at the, you know, where the spectral lines appear in a spectrum, and that tells you about the velocity or the actual dynamics of the gas and stars that are moving in the galaxy. Okay, so let's focus a little bit on some of the specific science questions that uh, Webb will be particularly useful in addressing. Uh, of course, Webb will um, look at a variety of uh, astronomical sources and uh, teach us a lot of new stuff about, uh, you know, um, galaxies and stars and star forming regions. But I'm going to pick out certain topics that are like the key science uh, problems for Webb because Webb is particularly designed to excel in studying these um, uh, targets. So first of all, star forming regions, uh, we already talked about how uh, star forming regions are very dusty, stars form in these molecular clouds, which are kind of, you know, dense regions of gas and dust. Uh, so it's often in visible light, it's very difficult to really penetrate the dust and really see the actual cocoons inside of which these stars are forming. And because Webb has infrared vision, we will be able to penetrate through these dense uh, clouds and actually see the location of the star formation and the details of what's happening, uh, you know, as stars form. Uh, and here, here, I mean, if you look on the right hand side here, um, here are some of the little, uh, you know, dense structures that were seen when Hubble looked at the Orion region. So you see these little disk like structures which are essentially disks around newly formed stars. And these are really dense disks of gas and dust. And uh, our current, I mean, our understanding is that these are the regions from where uh, planets form around stars. So uh, in an illustration here at the top, I'm essentially showing, uh, you know, our understanding of how stars and planets form. So, um, so the first, the first, um, you know, the picture essentially shows you how the gas essentially collapses to form stars. And when the gas collapses to form stars, uh, the gas often is rotating and it has a certain angular momentum. So the gas settles into a disk. And over time, this gas disk um, will essentially cool down and uh, it can fragment and then form uh, planets around the star. And we do actually see uh, examples of these kind of actual disks from which planets can form. That is what is shown in the bottom panel here. Uh, this is an ALMA image. That is an image taken in the millimeter wavelengths with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. And this is the image of a protoplanetary disk, HL Tauri, in the Taurus constellation. And you can actually see these different rings from which, you know, this is what theory told us that, you know, you will have these uh, rings of gas and that's where the planets are formed. So what Webb will be able to do is Webb can take a mid-infrared spectrum because it has very high resolution, spatial resolution. It can actually uh, resolve these, you know, it can actually uh, resolve the rings and actually take spectra of the rings. And when we look into the spectra of these rings, what we're expecting to see are signatures of um, molecules like methane, ammonia, acetylene, hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide, and so on. And these are essentially the kind of molecules that uh, will help us understand uh, what exactly the composition of the planets is going to be and whether they have the conditions um, similar to the planets in our solar system, whether they can host life, and so on. So that is a nice segue into my next topic. And this is one of the, um, uh, you know, search for habitable worlds is one of the key signs that uh, the Webb telescope can address. 
So let's take a step back a little bit and take a look at what we know about exoplanets so far. So when I talk about exoplanets, uh, what we mean is planets that are orbiting other stars in the Milky Way, okay? So these are not planets that belong to our solar system, but they can be similar solar system-like uh, systems that are, you know, formed by other stars. So you can have planetary systems that are orbiting other stars, and those are what we refer to as exoplanets. Now, this is a relatively new field of study in the sense that, you know, we really started discovering uh, exoplanets only sometime in the mid 80s. And then their number, it's very hard to find exoplanets because, you know, um, it's, I mean, first of all, I mean, these are really small objects and they're going around other stars. Uh, so it's really difficult to actually find them. But over years, one of the main uh, things is they have been dedicated telescopes like Kepler and TESS. And, um, you know, and also there are different methods by which we have been able to identify exoplanets. And here on the uh, on the right side, you actually see a figure which shows the, how the number of exoplanet detections have increased over year, over time. And you can really see how remarkable the increase has been. And now in the year 2022, uh, we know more than 4,000 confirmed planetary uh, you know, exoplanet systems. And you see that there are different methods by which you can actually detect exoplanets. Uh, and like, for example, you can, you know, look at the radial velocity variations, you can look at transits, you can do micro lensing, you can do direct imaging. Uh, but the thing I want you to notice is the drastic increase in the number of uh, exoplanets that were discovered using transit methods. And that is an example of what I'm showing you here on the left uh, side of the uh, screen, where you actually see how if you continue to monitor the brightness of a star, when a planet goes in front of the star, a part of the um, surface area of the star is being obstructed by the planet, and you begin to see a small dip in the brightness. And how much it dips really depends on the size of the planet. So when you have a bigger planet that is transiting uh, the, in front of the star, star, then you actually see a bigger dip. And then you can keep monitoring a system like that. And then you know about the orbital period, you know about the size of the planet, and then you know, you kind of understand those systems uh, better in terms of how many planets there are and what their uh, sizes are or their masses are. <coughs> so of course, I mean, when you have 4,000 planets, the natural question that comes to mind is, uh, we have eight planets in our solar system and we know that one of them hosts life. And we are all part of it. So it's only natural to wonder how many more are there. If there are 4,000 planets, definitely they must have life, right? Um, so here is a very interesting system. This is the, uh, the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, so this is um, an M star. It's an M dwarf star that is about 40 light years away from the Earth. And this is a very interesting system because it has seven rocky planets that are orbiting this M dwarf star. And out of, the, out of the seven planets, three of them lie in what is called the habitable zone. And the way we define the habitable zone is um, the region around a star where a planet can actually hold liquid water. So what that means is that the planet is not too close to the star that all the water evaporates, nor is it too far away from uh, the, the host star that you know, most of the water is just ice. In the habitable zone, it's the flux coming from the star and the distance of the uh, planet is such that it can actually hold the liquid water. And the interesting thing about this TRAPPIST-1 system is you have three out of the seven planets lying in the habitable zone. And also another fun fact about the TRAPPIST-1 system is that, uh, so this is an M dwarf star, right? So it's a very small star. Uh, it's uh, only about 9% of the mass of uh, you know, the sun. So this entire solar system, uh, uh, the, the entire planetary system around TRAPPIST-1 is so compact that the entire uh, planetary system of TRAPPIST can fit into the orbit of Mercury if you just look at the scale. Um, so what will Webb do with, you know, the exoplanets? <clears throat> now remember, Webb is not a telescope that you will essentially use for hunting for exoplanets. You will not be using it to really um, 
uh, discover exoplanets, but on the other hand, I mean, you may discover uh, as I come to the next slide, but for the ex exoplanet systems that we already are uh, aware about, what you can do is actually study their atmospheres to look for um, biosignatures. So what you would essentially do is you would use the same transit method but you would do spectroscopy. Now think about, uh, I just want you to think about a planet. Now the planet has an atmosphere. It has a thin atmosphere around it, just like the earth, for example. And now when this planet goes in front of the star, there is one particular point where you can get the starlight to come through the atmosphere of the planet. And again, when the planet is just exiting in front of the star, you get another sight line where you can look through the atmosphere of the planet. So essentially, Webb is sensitive enough that it can actually take, do transit spectroscopy and take spectra while the planets are entering and exiting you know, the, in, in front of the star. And you can use that atmosphere spectroscopy or the spectra of the atmosphere of the planet to look for oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on, which are essentially the kind of biomolecules or uh, elements that you would look for um, to uh, look for light. I mean, look for you know life on uh, on the planet. So that is the technique with which it will be uh, looking for habitable planets. Now, uh, Webb can also take pictures and you know just image the planets. It can actually uh, so it uses what is called a coronagraph. A coronagraph can essentially block. Um, a bright source and you know reveal all of the faint structures around it. Uh, a simple way to uh, think about this is essentially what happens during the solar eclipse, right? So during the solar eclipse, you have the moon is essentially masking off the um, the disk of the sun, and you can actually see the faint uh, corona around uh, the sun, which you otherwise wouldn't. So a coronagraph essentially does the same thing. So you have a mask in your instrument, which essentially blocks off the light coming from the star, which is usually very bright compared to the planets. And then you can actually take images after you block off that light, you can take images to actually see the faint planets. And if you keep taking these images over a period of time, uh, you can actually see how the planets move. And that gives you again, you know, information about the planet uh, orbital parameters and so on. So Webb will have the ability to do that as well. Now, uh, from the, now all of this time we've been talking about things that Webb would do for you know things that are closer to home. But now I just want to delve into something that's really close to my heart. This is the kind of science that I do, is to actually study the very first galaxies and stars with the Webb telescope. So uh, I'm going to start off here with a movie that essentially. Um, so this is this image that you see here is essentially one of the very deep fields or very long staring observations that Hubble has taken of one small patch of the uh, universe. And you see that in this small patch, you see innumerable number of galaxies. But what is beautiful is that all of these galaxies are not at the same distance. You're seeing these are very deep images. So you're looking uh, at galaxies that are very faint. And some of these very faint galaxies are also among the most distant galaxies. Because we know that, um, you know, in a, so we know that light takes some time to reach from objects to us. For example, we know that the nearest uh, star is um, Proxima Centauri. It's about four light years away. So light takes about four years to come from Proxima Centauri to us. So we are seeing the light today as it left the star four years ago. So similarly, when we're looking at galaxies that are say a billion light years away, we are seeing the galaxy the way it was a billion uh, years ago because it has taken light that long to reach us. So these deep images actually show us faint galaxies that are at different distances. So we can actually take snapshots of the universe by taking a deep image like this, you can select galaxies that are at different distances, which means you're looking at different cosmic times. And an image like this allows us to then understand how galaxies have evolved over time and piece the whole picture together uh, of how galaxies have evolved both in their, um, you know, in the amount of stars they're producing uh, in their size and, you know, how, how significant have mergers been in forming galaxies and so on. So 
um, when you put together uh, these pictures, like I said, you can put a snapshot together and then use that to study the evolution of galaxies. So, um, so when you look at these, when you take these snapshots and look at galaxies at different distances, one of the things that strikes you is that these very regular spiral kind of structures that you see in the nearby universe, you don't really see that when you go to very distant galaxies. It looks like they're really forming in little bits and pieces. And when, when you look at the most distant galaxies, you essentially see them like this red blob. Um, and the reason why you see them as a red blob is because for, there are two reasons. For one thing, the red color is because all of the blue light that you see has now been redshifted so much because we know that when light travels in an expanding universe, uh, you know, it shifts from the wavelength of the light shifts from shorter wavelengths to the longer wavelengths. And this, this is called redshifting. And uh, so these objects, the light from these very distant objects has been redshifted so much that you're now beginning to see all of the visible and optical light in the infrared or towards the redder wavelengths. And the reason why they're kind of blobs is because you know you don't really have the sufficient resolution to actually look, uh, the spatial resolution to actually look at the structure within these um, uh, galaxies. So because Hubble was a 2.4 meter telescope, it didn't have uh, enough power to resolve sources at these distances, although it did a remarkable job in the nearby universe. As you go to these fainter sources, it becomes difficult. So this is essentially where the web telescopes come into play because web telescope can actually see, uh, it can, it's, it's big enough it, that it can actually see the very first galaxies and stars. And it also has enough resolution to kind of show you the early stages of galaxy assembly. So here's a cartoon which essentially shows you the cosmic timeline. On the right side uh, is the very early universe. So you see the Big Bang, and then there was this period of um, you know, very hot plasma, which then recombined, and then you have the cosmic microwave radiation emitted. And after that, we kind of go into this very dark phase, or the dark ages, as it's called, because you essentially didn't have any source of light. Uh, it was just gas. And then at some point in the very early universe, you know, between 100 and about 400 million years, uh, you essentially started forming the first stars and first galaxies. And then all of these first stars and first galaxies further ionized the universe. Uh, and then you get into what's called the reionization era. And then, you know, you have more and more uh, galaxies growing bigger and then coming to the present day galaxies on the left side here. Now with Hubble, we have been able to see galaxies all the way up to a redshift of 11. And the redshift of 11 corresponds to about 13.4 uh, billion years ago. So that means we are seeing these galaxies at a time when the universe was only about 400 million years. But beyond that, the light is so redshifted that Hubble cannot get, the, get to those wavelengths. And this is essentially Webb's new frontier. Right? And because Webb is particularly designed to access those wavelengths and with high resolution. So then you can ask the question, why are we really after, you know, this, although it's such a small window, right? I mean, we're so keen on finding all of these sources between 100 million years and, you know, just barely a giga year. So this is, like I mentioned earlier, this, this is a very important phase in the um, evolution of the universe because you're going from something called the dark ages where there were no sources uh, into where there were no really light emitting sources. You're going into this period of what is called the reionization. And one of the big questions that we have is about do we have enough high energy photons like ultraviolet radiation uh, to completely ionize you know, the neutral gas that was there during the dark ages, right? I mean, how did we actually go from this period of dark ages when there was no light source into, and the gas was mostly neutral, how did we then get into this phase where uh, most of the universe is now ionized? And what are the sources that can actually ionize uh, that much gas, right? So it's a question of did star forming galaxies do that or did you need active galactic nuclei which are powered by black holes? If so, then how many black holes were there? What were their masses? So there are a lot, there's a lot of questions that we don't know about what happened during this period. And it's a very important period in the history of the universe. So this is why we're focusing on that, um, you know, that particular period. 
So like I said, the current record holder for the most distant galaxy is this galaxy GNZ 11. And the light that we see today left the galaxy about 13.4 billion uh, years ago. So that's about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So how will Webb uh, you know, improve upon this? So for one thing, as light travels in an expanding universe, it stretches. And as I said, you know, now the light from these objects has uh, redshifted so much that you cannot access it uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, which only goes up to about two microns. Um, uh, so you really want to go beyond that to get the infrared radiation from these uh, sources, the redshifted infrared radiation. So, uh, so Webb's infrared uh, you know, vision makes it possible to get these uh, infrared wavelengths. And also you have uh, you know, a much larger mirror, which means it has a large, it's a big, large light collecting bucket. So it's a hundred times more powerful than the Hubble uh, telescope. So the Hubble telescope had about, uh, the mirror diameter was 2.4 meters, whereas the Webb telescope is 6.5 meters. So it's going to be able to collect a lot more photons uh, from very, very faint objects. So with that, what we expect is that Webb will be able to actually show us the details in the very first galaxies. And the example that I show you here, uh, on the right side is that very distant galaxy, the most distant that we know. And we're hoping that you know, when we look at it with Webb, we will be able to see details of the, you know, uh, the morphology. Uh, for example, here is one of the galaxies, Wiki 18, which is an example of what young galaxies might look like. So uh, although, you know, we may not see with this clarity, but uh, of course, this is a nearby object, so you can really see it with a uh, very uh, you know, high spatial resolution. But we do certainly hope that you know, you'll be able to say something about the structure of what these galaxies look like. And uh, also, you know, uh, Webb will be able to look at the redshift and light from the galaxy, so we can actually um, look at the spectrum and talk about the chemical elements uh, that make up these distant galaxies. Okay, and in addition to that, we will also combine the power of the Webb telescope with gravitational lensing. So we know that gravitational lensing is a phenomenon where light travels through, uh, you know, space time, the space time, and when you have a massive object, it tends to kind of curve the uh, space fabric and makes it, uh, you know, makes the light deflect. And it almost acts like a lens, and it essentially has the property of any optical lens, whereby the uh, images of the galaxies in the background are magnified uh, and amplified. So you see them, things that you would not be able to see if the lens wasn't there become uh, possible to see when you have, uh, you know, these um, lensing effect. So you would be able to see very faint galaxies when you look through, you know, using the nature's lens or gravitational lensing. Um, so these are some of the ways we will study the very distant galaxies. And uh, in addition to the planets and first galaxies, we will explore a lot more about you know, star clusters, supermassive black holes, and so on. So I only have a little bit of time left. So I'm just going to race through the <laughs> next couple of slides where I really want to talk to you a little bit more about the telescopes. So we've seen what fantastic science a web telescope can do. So let's take a quick look at the details of the telescope, because this telescope is really an engineering marvel. Uh, so if you think about it, it's a really, really big telescope. Uh, so it has a primary mirror that's 6.5 meters, uh, that's about 21 feet, and it has, it's made of segments. It has 18 segments. Uh, each of these segments are about, you know, 1.32 meters. And uh, for a size scale, you can see the person standing here, and you know, on a you can actually see uh, the relative size of a human versus the mirror, and you can see how big these mirrors, uh, the mirror actually is. And each of these segments, uh, I mean, the primary mirror segments are made of beryllium, and they're coated with gold to improve the infrared uh, reflectivity. And because Webb has to look in the infrared, we want to shield the mirror and all of the detectors that are being used to take images and spectra, we want to shield it from any source of infrared radiation. So you have the sun, you have the earth, um, all of which actually kind of you know, tend to heat the observatory, and then the observatory will start glowing in infrared, and 
I mean, that would be very high background. So you will not be able to see the kind of, you know, it won't have the sensitivity to see the very faint uh, infrared radiation that is coming from the astronomical sources. So this is why Webb has a really big tennis court sized uh, sun shield. And the sun shield is actually made of a material called Kepton, and it has five layers. And these layers are kind of spaced out so that, um, you know, each successive layer helps uh, to keep, I mean, it, it progressively cools uh, from the sun facing side to the uh, cool side and all of the telescope uh, mirror and the instruments will be on the cool side of the uh, telescope and that's what I show here in the next. Uh, that's what I show here in the next slide. Uh, so essentially, uh, web will always be facing away from the sun and away from the earth. And so you have the sunlight side, which is essentially heating up the observatory. And then the successive layers of the sun shield essentially allow you to radiate away all of the heat so that the upper layer remains extremely cool. And what is uh, really fascinating from the technology and uh, technology point of view is how efficient this material is in you know, creating this very big temperature difference, right? I mean, it's able to, on the sun facing side, uh, the temperature is about 125 degrees Celsius. And on the cooler side, it's minus 235 degrees Celsius. So it's almost a 400 degrees Celsius uh, temperature difference, you know, between these uh, five layers on the sun facing side and in the opposite side. And like I mentioned earlier, all of the mirror and the secondary mirror and the instruments are located um, on the cooler side and the sun facing side essentially has all the uh, antennae that communicates with the earth and the solar power array, of course, which you need for powering the spacecraft. And um, also it has all of the, um, uh, yeah, so all of the electronics and controls are on that side. And Web also has a set of, uh, you know, um, four science instruments. There is a NIRCAM, which is the primary imaging uh, instrument. There is NIRSPEC, which is a very powerful uh, uh, instrument for taking spectra. There is the MIRI instrument, which observes in the mid-infrared, takes both images and spectra. And then there is the nearest instrument, which is again an imaging and a spectroscopy instrument. Uh, so I will skip the slide. It just shows you all of the uh, capabilities available on web. But uh, the thing to remember is that what's really marvelous is you really had to fold this telescope completely to uh, make it fit into the fairing of the rocket. So you can see that the primary mirror had to be folded. Uh, so the three segments on the left and the three segments on the right had to be folded back. And also this entire big tennis court sized sun shield had to be folded in order to fit it into the rocket. And once it was launched, um, that, okay, and, and of course, I mean, we had a fantastic launch and, you know, here is the web separation and some of my favorite views of the web launch. Uh, so this is the telescope separating away from the rocket. And then you have this image, which was taken by uh, someone from Thailand, uh, which actually shows the web telescope along with the comet uh, Leonard. And so these are kind of my favorite images during the launch. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, so so the telescope is actually launched, like I said, I mean, it's uh, away uh, to a point called the second Lagrange point, which is about 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. And one of the reasons why we wanted Web to be launched in this very, uh, you know, far away from the Sun and the Earth is essentially because, you know, we want to keep it away from the, uh, you know, heat and the radiation coming from the Sun and the Earth. Uh, and also uh, the point L2 is one of the, um, you know, uh, it, it's a semi-stable or a metastable point uh, in, you know, when you have, if you consider uh, two massive objects and a third body, it becomes like a three body problem. And um, this is a point which is semi-stable because that's where the gravitational forces and the centrifugal force keep the uh, satellite in equilibrium. And also it takes it, uh, you know, it, 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 it continues to keep the satellite in the same line as the uh, sun earth system. So you can essentially communicate and do data transfer easily um, when it is at the second Lagrange point. 
And also it's in an orbit that goes along with the sun and the earth without being in a trailing orbit. Um, and at the point L2, the spacecraft is not essentially just standing in one point. Instead, it does have kind of a halo orbit. So that is what is shown here in this illustration. So, uh, it, it, so the spacecraft is traveling along with the earth as it goes around the sun, but also it actually does have an orbit around L2 itself. So it's not eclipsed by the sun uh, or by the earth or you know, by the moon at any point. It always um, kind of you know, is uh, orbiting around L2. And it's a fairly large orbit. It's uh, you know, just the diameter of the orbit itself is about 800,000 kilometers. And it finishes one orbit around L2 in about six months. Um, so the beautiful thing about Webb was, you know, this was never done before, is actually the deployment of an observatory as it goes to the point L2. So other telescopes have been launched to L2, but they were all already assembled, right? So it was just launched and then just sent it there. But the beauty of this telescope was it was folded in order to pack it into the rocket. And as it is going to L2, it had so many deployments to do. It had to deploy the, uh, you know, the sun shield first, and then it had to tension the sun shield and then get it all firm and tensed up, all the five layers separate out. Then it had to bring down the secondary mirror, align the secondary mirror, and you know the primary mirror wings, which were folded back in order to fit into the rocket, had to open up. And this entire deployment took about 25 days, or I think it was about 25 or 27 days. And then all of this happened while it was traveling towards L2. And then on the 29th day, there was a final burn that actually put it into the orbit. So as you can see, so that yellow trajectory on this figure essentially shows the trajectory of the spacecraft and then the final burn, which actually now puts it into this big halo orbit around Elton. Uh, and then one quick uh, slide to show you how we communicate with the web is essentially through the deep space network. So you get you send commands from SDSEI, that is the institute where I am. You send it through the deep space network to web, and then you get the you know data downlink. Uh, it, it's downloaded back uh, to the Space Telescope Science Institute. So what is web doing now? Well. Just like every spoiled uh, modern day person, a web took a selfie. <laughs> so uh, there is the uh, there is a selfie of the primary mirror from Webb. So this was essentially made possible because of a special kind of lens that is located on one of the instruments, the NeoCam instrument. And this um, lens was essentially for looking at the alignment of the different segments of the mirror. And currently what's going on is Webb has just finished its initial uh, alignment uh, of the uh, you know, images coming from the different uh, mirrors. So like I said, it's an 18 segment mirror. So when you first deploy the mirror, uh, it's not all completely aligned and you will get 18 points of light. If you look at one star, it appears as 18 points of light because each of, this mirror, each of these mirrors are behaving like individual telescopes. Uh, and then we had to really identify which segment belongs or which image belongs to which mirror segment, identify them, that is called the segment identification uh, phase. And then you bring them all together into this hexagonal pattern. You can see that each of these hexagonal points are not really um, in focus. So they were then, once they were brought into the correct array uh, configuration, they were then focused and then now the image stacking has been completed. And now the, you know, now what is going on is actually aligning the different instruments. Like I said, there are four instruments. So those four, four instruments are now being aligned uh, to get the perfect focus. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, so Web is uh, doing so well. It's going exactly as we planned at the different phases where it is right now. But the entire commissioning of the telescope will take about six months from launch. So around May or June is when you're expecting the commissioning to be completed. The first signs images will be released sometime in the summer of 2022. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah, so I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Sorry. Wonderful. This is a great and exciting thing. One of the things, uh, uh, let's let's all applaud uh, Swara's talk. It, uh, it's, it's wonderful. There are many, many questions floating in from the various uh, streaming platforms that we have put your talk on. Um, can I begin by asking you, um, Swara, can you uh, tell us uh, a little bit about your involvement 
um, in the instrument team, as well as what's going on now, it would be very exciting for us to know what you do. Sure. So, uh, so I am actually involved with the instrument called NERIS, that is a near infrared imager and slittle spectrograph. This is an instrument that is contributed by the Canadian Space Agency. And I am an instrument scientist on that telescope. So what my involvement is, is mainly in the commissioning and calibration of the instrument. So after six months of commissioning, we will release the instrument for use by the community. But before we let the astronomers use it, we need to know the performance of the instrument. You know, we need to calibrate, you know, uh, are we doing the wavelength calibration correctly? What is the uh, point spread function of the instrument? So these are the kind of things that the, the users want to know before using the instrument. So we need to understand the instrument, make sure that it's performing the way we expected uh, you know, from the ground, we had already tested and we know what it's supposed to do. So we want to make sure that, you know, the performance is optimal before we start the science observations. That's great. Thank you. And then we are very, very proud of you, uh, Swara, and, and the fact that this is going so well. Uh, there are so many questions. Uh, Pratik Deshpande, uh, very early on, asked, um, you said that uh, JWST needs fuel. Why does JWST need fuel? Uh, is it um, um, because it's going to be at rest there forever? Can't it be operated for as long as we want? Why is there a finite lifetime? So there are two questions. Why does it need fuel and why, does, why is there a finite lifetime? Right. So, uh, so the thing is, uh, you know, uh, in L2, it is actually, like I showed in one of the last slides, I'm sorry I rushed through it, but it's not really just standing there, right? I mean, it is actually in a halo orbit and you need to keep correcting the orbit. And you do that essentially by kind of, you know, doing what is called a, by giving a thrust to the uh, observatory. So you continue to keep it in that orbit and it does actually use a fuel for that. Uh, sorry, what was the other question? What is the fuel? Well, that, that's right. So, and why is there a finite lifetime? Um, right. Why can't it be operated forever? Yeah, so it cannot be operated forever exactly for that reason, because at some point we will run out of fuel. And uh, the reason why I mentioned that in the beginning about, uh, you know, how optimal the launch was is because, um, so you needed to give the observatory the right thrust uh, to, you know, kind of really slow it down by the time we get to L2 um, and then give the final thrust to get into the L2 orbit. Now, if you had given it you know, too much, if it required too much thrust, then the thing is you will be using too much fuel, which means that reduces the lifetime of the observatory. So initially we had, the plan was to essentially have this for a lifetime of, you know, five to 10 years, but because the launch was so optimal, now there is enough fuel to keep the observatory going for about 20 years. And, you know, that is kind of a, it, it's a really good thing. So it, it's really dependent on the fuel. That's what, if the fuel runs out, then, you know, we won't be able to keep the observatory aligned um, anymore. And that's when, you know, it will have to stop functioning. Because the, some questions were asked early on before you came to this, there was a confusion about um, um, this being the same place where Aditya L1 is going, but Aditya L1 is going to Lagrangian 1. This is Lagrangian 2, and I hope um, people realize that this is a different point in space, another Lagrangian point, yeah. which uh, exactly. later was, was shown very well. Yeah, go ahead. Right, and, and, and especially from that point of view, uh, I just wanted to mention, so uh, remember that, you know, with web, you really don't want to look at the sun. <laughs> Whereas with, if you wanted to put a solar probe, you would probably put it at another Lagrange point where you are, you know, you can see the sun. Whereas here, you're essentially trying to be as far away from the sun and to look away from the sun as possible. <laughs> so that's right. So, I, 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 so this is why it's, it, this is the Lagrangian point that's, that's very far away. Kiran Mehta asks a very interesting question. Kiran always asks very interesting questions, saying, you know, if serviceability has been sacrificed, anyway, because uh, unlike Hubble, we are not going to go and service things, then why send it to L2 um, uh, around, around here? Why not L2 around Mars or something like that? Uh, then, okay, so... Well, I mean, somewhat, you know, why, why, uh, uh, why, why was L2 uh, the Earth-Sun orbit chosen? That's the idea. That's what, what he's Right, asking. okay. So, you know, first of all, think about the energy considerations, right? I mean, when you can achieve the same thing by going to uh, L2 of the Sun-Earth system, why would you spend extra energy and go to Mars? 
uh, that's one point. And another thing also to remember is that, you know, it's not just about, uh, it's not like simply a technology demonstration, right? You also want to communicate with the satellite and get the data back, right? You want to download the data back at a reasonable rate. Uh, and so, you know, it's optimal to really launch it uh, at the Sun Earth L2. And, you know, you're always communicating with the satellite. Uh, for example, it only takes uh, about, you know, six seconds to communicate back and forth from the web telescope and also, you know, downlink the data. So, yeah. So unless you have a okay. really strong reason to go to another location, uh, one wouldn't think that. Also think about the energy considerations to go there. Yeah, there's always that thing. I mean, you know, you can't really, you, you need telemetry, you need the information to come, you can't take it away so far away from the earth. Um, um, K.R. Rampat asks, uh, um, how, is there any 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 way that JWST can be protected from micrometeorite impacts or uh, or space debris? I mean, what what is the thought on that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, actually. So that is one of the considerations. Uh, so first of all, remember, we know about the space conditions around L2 because there have been uh, other observatories that have been launched at L2. Webb is not definitely the first one that was launched at L2, right? We have Planck is already there. Yeah. WMAP is already there. The Herschel telescope is already there. So we know about the space conditions. Oh, yeah. And definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah, and definitely the micrometeorites was a consideration. So what the Webb telescope uh, has is one of the, so it depends, the biggest surface area is provided by the sun shield, right? So that's the likely one that's likely to get impacted uh, with the micrometeorites. So there are some things called the rip stops that are provided on the sun shield. So the thing is, even if a micrometeorite uh, tears a little bit, that tear will not grow because there are rip stops to stop the ripping. So, you know, you may get a small tear, but it won't just then become bigger and bigger and just tear through the whole thing. There are rip stops at many, many rip stops that are provided on the, um, on the sun shield. Great, thanks. Um, um, more questions. Uh, uh, let's see how much are we doing in time. Let's let's go for a, a last one. Suraj is asking: Is there any uh, citizen science program being planned for people like us who can actually interact with the data as they as they come in and and are being used? So, what is the data distribution strategy? And do you know of people who are already planning citizen science programs? So fantastic. Uh, yeah, I mean, so one of the beauty of astronomy is, you know, a lot of the data actually becomes public and astronomy is a field that has always encouraged uh, citizen science. So uh, just like we did with the Hubble Space Program, uh, what will happen with JWST is you will be, uh, I mean, astronomers from all over the world can propose for time on the telescope. Once you get time on the telescope, then, you know, the data is yours. But for others, if you're not proposing for a specific program, there's always the archive. The data will go into the archive and the archive will be publicly available, just like with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, do you have a couple of uh, uh, time for a couple more, more questions, Swara? Then there, sure. there are more questions coming in, coming in, coming in. It's a question from Chaitanya, who says, um, uh, when can we first expect uh, the first spectacular images from JWST yeah. like we see from the, from the Hubble? Yes, good question. I mean, I'm also waiting for that. <laughs> so, like I said, uh, so the commissioning is when we are actually making sure that the telescope is working the way it should. Uh, you know, so far, so good, all good news. We're getting the images, but now we have to test the individual instruments, right? Overall, of course, it's working fine, but now the individual instruments have to take images and spectra, make sure everything's fine. And that will be the end of the commissioning period after six months of uh, after launch. So that will be around June. Uh, so the first science images are likely to come around, you know, maybe June, July. So sometimes summer of this year is when we're expecting that. That's really exciting to 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 wait for for the images. I, you remember the the first images after Hubble was fixed, and how that yeah. completely changed uh, our our view of uh, of the you know, ultraviolet and optical world. And and to get these images, that I hope hopefully there will be no hitches at the, at the beginning. There's uh, there's a question from um, uh, from Pratik Deshpande again about uh, you know we know that we we followed that during the deployment phase. Because it was so complicated, we had 300 or odd um, uh, uh, various failures. But um, once it starts going, are there any potential, um, um, you know, points of failure that one needs to worry about? Uh, 
interesting question. Yeah, so um, I think that the most risky phase of the Webb telescope is really the deployment itself. Um, but once it deploys and it starts functioning, we really don't see uh, any big you know, risk factors other than, you know, something failing to work. But remember, for the, for the kind of things that can happen at L2, we have a lot of redundancies built in, uh, you know, um, for, for the power supply or for, you know, even, you know, for example, the imaging instrument near CAM has two identical modules. So even if one fails, you know, the other one will be there. So there are a lot of redundancies built in uh, for the kind of things that can happen now. Uh, so I think the risk is pretty much just like with any other observatory, right? I mean, like with Hubble or with any other observatory there, uh, the risk is not any more than that for this particular observatory. Great, thanks. I think I think we um, um, we have to move on with, with the rest of the program. So thank you so much, Swarat, for being with us, spending the time. I'm sure you have lots of uh, work to do along with uh, the telescope itself. Your day is about to start. Um, good luck with it. And uh, Godspeed, we, uh, we hope to see the great images very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And all of you enjoy the rest of your sky watching tonight. Absolutely. Bye. Uh, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. Bye. Right, has the streaming ended? Great. Thanks. No, sir. We will continue this meeting itself. So we are now Thank moving you. over to the sky washing session. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Just a minute. We are waiting for uh, our friends to join from the Ayuka Terrace. So uh, before we start the sky watching session, let me give you a brief uh, overview. So uh, today we are connected to you from the Ayuka's Muktangan Vidyan Shodhika or the MVS, uh, which is also known, known as Ayuka SIPOP. Now Ayuka SIPOP runs various programs. Uh, one of the examples that you saw a little while back was the teacher training programs that we conduct. So currently we are collaborating with uh, teachers from Zilla Parishad schools and they are creating some very effective materials for school students to uh, uh, help them explain different concepts in physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, and all, all the subjects in all. So all the science and math subjects basically. And uh, apart from that, we run regular school student summer programs and we also uh, host uh, sky watches every Fridays and we host campus visits of Ayuka on every Thursdays. So because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were not able to carry on the in-person events uh, as effectively as we could. But uh, most of the uh, events have now been shifted to virtual mode. And in the afternoon, we saw the campus tour of Ayuka. Right? And we also saw the campus tour of the Ayuka Giravali Observatory. Similarly, we are going to watch the sky tour now. And to get a feel that you are watching it from Ayuka, we have created a customized landscape in a simulation planetarium software, which is known as Stellarium, right? So most of you must have used this software uh, or must have seen somebody use this software. So this is a, a free software uh, available on all platforms and uh, the free versions are existing on mobile phones as well. So you can simply download the application, you can set your location and you can easily move around and you can move around uh, forward and reverse in time. So uh, without further ado, let me quickly share my screen and I will quickly show you the preview of Stellaria. Give me one moment. So I hope my uh, screen is visible now. If not, it will be in a few seconds. Let me just quickly check. <coughs> All right. So now what you see is the view of the Stellarium software. I'm waiting for the people. Yeah. So in this software, you can change the different landscapes. And like I said, you can move forward and ahead in time using these play and pause and forward reverse buttons. But there is also a menu on the left hand side, which allows you to 
move over uh, through different years you can change different months you can change days and also the time of the day right so let's let's go to the afternoon let's say it is 3 30 now uh, if on 27th of February which is today and this is how the Ayuga campus looks in the afternoon and what we have done is we have clicked a 360 degree image similar to the campus walkthrough that we showed and uh, in that walkthrough uh, what we have done is we have stood right at the center of our kund okay so what when Ayuga was constructed so this central area was metaphor metaphorically named as kund which is often uh, referred to as an expanding universe and this is actually a model of a black hole and you can uh, these purple colored things are basically the jets which stream out of the poles of the black holes and then there is an imaginary black hole at the center so in a way we are standing uh, exactly at the center of this kund area and you can see all the important elements of the Ayuka architecture. You can see the four statues. This is the administrative building. This is the residential quarters. This is the canteen. This is library and all that. So uh, what we have done is we have uh, rotated this uh, landscape to match the uh, directions accurately. Now uh, what we can do is we can get to the real time. So this is the current sky. Now unfortunately the sky outside has a lot of clouds. So we, we might have to do most of the sky watching session uh, from the simulations itself. So in this software, uh, you can see that the current location has been set to Pune in Ayuka and the landscape is from Ayuka too. Uh, the menu can give you different uh, you know parameters. So for example, you can change your location from Pune to any other city in the world or you can click, uh, you can select your location to any other planet or the moons of different planets. So we will not get into the specifics of the software, but we will basically do a quick run through or walk through of a sky. Okay. So as soon as the sun sets, you can start seeing very bright stars on the southeast region. Okay. And those stars are basically the stars of the Orion constellation or in Marathi, we call it as Mruga Nakshatra. So I will try to, uh, you know, recollect or, uh, you know, revise the same uh, sky session that I'm doing right now quickly in Marathi and uh, today is basically the Marathi uh, Bhasha Divas and uh, it is celebrated to commemorate uh, the legendary writer Kusum Agraj, also known as Viva Shirvadkar and we will try to conduct this sky session in Marathi as well to celebrate the Marathi Divas and uh, uh, before, I, before I continue in Marathi let me, let me quickly show you some bright stars that have started to appear right so the good thing about Stellarium is because it is a planetarium software, you can switch on and off a lot of things, right? You can turn the ground off and then you can see the sun has gone below the horizon and just close to the sun, there is planet Jupiter. Now in the daytime, you cannot see planet Jupiter because the sky is too bright. Okay. And many a times people have this misconception that where uh, in the daytime, you cannot see stars and most common answer that you get is because of the sun. So the real answer is yes, partially, you cannot see the sky because of the sunlight, but it is not the sunlight that is uh, avoiding you from looking at stars. It is the atmosphere, which is scattering all that sunlight, right? And the brightness of the sky is increasing a lot, a lot more than the brightness of the stars. So had there been no atmosphere or a rarer atmosphere, we would have seen stars in the daytime as well. Right? So similarly, uh, you, you must have seen the videos of launches. So whenever a spacecraft launches uh, and as it leaves the atmosphere, uh, you can immediately see stars as well as the sun in the background. And you can see, uh, you must have seen many such images and many such videos. So uh, uh, whenever we start a sky session, we typically start from the west. Now the good part about Stellarium is you can also change your landscapes. So right now if I stand in the center of the Kund, my western horizon is a little bit blocked, right? So I can go to the landscapes and I can change the, change my uh, landscape to maybe Ayuka Giravli Observatory. So <clears throat> for example, uh, if I select this landscape, now you can see that the west horizon is clear. And this is how the Ayuka Giravli campus looks like. So I am in the central foyer of Ayuka Giravli Observatory. And this is the residential complex. And over here, you can see the dome of the Ayuka Giravli Observatory. Okay, and uh, you, have, you can see the sun has set just very close to the west, southwestern region, 
and uh, the stars have started to appear. So as you see towards the west, you can see one very bright star in the northern region. Right? So the name of this star is Kapila. In Marathi, it is called as Brahmarudan. So this star is a part of a constellation called Auriga. Now you can also switch on the constellation labels, you can switch on the constellation art and also the constellation lines. So the constellation art is depicted according to the Greek mythology or the Western culture, right? So there are very interesting folklores and stories about different constellations and these stories help you connect them as well as remember the names of the stars and all the constellations and their positions, right? So you can see this is Origa or the charioter and uh, this Origa is made out of five stars. So uh, for better vi visibility, I'm going to switch off the art right now. So notice that this is the brightest star called Capella and Capella, uh, then uh, Menkalian, then this another one star uh, called Mahasin and Elnath and Hassela. Uh, all these stars together make this uh, constellation Origa and this star Elnath is common to both the constellations which is Taurus and Origa. Okay, so to avoid such confusion, the International Astronomical Union uh, had uh, went through an activity and they basically created what is known as boundaries uh, and they, they created the constellation boundaries which you can turn on from the sky and viewing options later okay so you can go to markings and what you can also switch on constellation boundaries and all that coming back so uh, as soon as the sun sets you can start looking at the brighter stars so what we will do is we will move in, uh, move along in the sequence of the uh, uh, zodiacal constellations. So I will turn the constellation li lines off. So as you see, uh, just above the west, there is the Pisces constellation, right? So the Pisces constellation is still uh, close to very close to the sun, and it, you cannot easily spot the full constellation. Just above that, there is this constellation called Aries the Ram, right? So it kind of looks like a hockey stick and uh, had there been no clouds, I would have loved to uh, conduct a sky session from outside, but uh, to, to move further. So this star is called as Hamal, okay, and this pair of stars or uh, group of stars is called as Ashwini Nakshatra, okay. So now there is a very important difference between a constellation and asterism and a nakshatra and a Rashi, okay. So a constellation is a western concept. A constellation is basically a group of many stars, right? So uh, an asterism is any uh, arbitrary shape held, made by connecting one or more stars, right? Now the Rashis or the zodiacal constellations are such constellations which lie on the zodiacal plane or, or on the ecliptic plane, okay? So now to understand what an ecliptic plane is, you need to understand what the ecliptic word really means. So ecliptic literally means the path of eclipses. Okay. So now whenever you observe the sun in the daytime, you can see the sun rises somewhere and sets somewhere else. Right. It rises in the east and it sets in the west. Now during its journey from east to west, it follows an apparent path in the sky. And that path is basically known as ecliptic. So in Stellarium, uh, you can turn on the ecliptic uh, line. So let's say if I switch on ecliptic line, then in the sky that an imaginary line will be drawn. Okay. Now let's uh, just for fun, rewind the time. So if I rewind, I will be able to see the sun moving along on this line of ecliptic. Now I can easily switch off my uh, atmosphere. So now you can see I'm able to see the stars in the daytime as well. So th there is no more scattering of sunlight and the sky is no longer brighter than the rest of the stars, right? So I will continue to rewind my time. Notice that the clock at the bottom of my screen has is uh, increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing. And you can see that the entire sky is moving and the sun is on this line called the ecliptic, right? Now I will pause the video and I will go to the data and time. And now let's see how the sun moves every month. So you can see the year, month, date, and this is the timing, right? So I will move on to the previous month. 
So in the previous month, the sun moved to the uh, sun was in the Taurus. So in February, the sun is in basically Aquarius. Right now, this no no the sun was in uh, Capricornus. Then the sun was in Aquarius. In March, the sun is in Pisces. In April, the sun is in Aries. I hope you can see the constellations over here and you can you are able to read the names. Let me just quickly check the screen. Yes, it looks good. So many of you are asking which software am I using? So this software is basically the Stellarium software. Uh, I will quickly type the name. So in this software, uh, you can easily simulate uh, your, the sky at your location and you can move you can see how the sky looks at some other location too and you can see as i'm pre proceeding with the months the sun is moving in the next zodiacal constellation so in the month of june the sun was in the gemini constellation in the month of july the sun was in the cancer constellation in the month of august it is in the leo constellation and so on now the interesting part about this is that this imaginary line that has been drawn in the sky is actually the apparent path of the sun and this path is called as the ecliptic and all the constellations which are lying on this line are known as uh, zodiacal constellations okay and those are basically the rashis that we call in the hindu mythology and along the lines of these rashis there is another path okay and that path is the apparent motion uh, or the path of the apparent motion of the moon now uh, this path is divided into 27 parts okay and the reason this path is divided into 27 parts is because moon requires uh, 27 days to complete one revolution around the earth okay so every day the star background which is uh, beyond the moon is identified as a one nakshatra so the nakshatras are known as lunar mansions and they have been first found or their references have been first found in uh, two or three different mythologies so uh, the chinese uh, astronomers often call them as lunar mansions uh, in in their culture and they also uh, identify these lunar mansions 27 lunar mansions we have our own different types of shapes and we have our own different types of uh, identifiers uh, for these lunar mansions so coming back to the present time present date and time so here we are so we started with the first constellation which was aries it is aries the ram uh, in marathi it is called as a menda then uh, it is basically the shape of a ram so the older uh, you know observational astronomers imagined these uh, three stars to be like a ram uh, on the right hand side there is a another interesting constellation called triangulum okay and in in triangulum uh, there is a very famous and a very beautiful object called the Triangulum's Galaxy. Okay, I can I can probably search. So if I zoom in, you can see a beautiful spiral galaxy, okay, and it is absolutely possible and very easily possible to click photographs of this galaxy. If you travel to a slightly darker location away from the city area, and if you give a series of images and long exposures for uh, a while, and if you are able to stack them together, then you can capture a similar beautiful image, okay. And we will keep on talking about uh, how to do astrophotography in this uh, in, in our series in the upcoming months. So do stay uh, do stay connected to our channel and uh, keep keep a look around for uh, different tidbits about astrophotography. Now we saw the Aries constellation and I told you that the star is called as the Ashwini nakshatra. Okay, and then uh, just as we move forward, you can see that there is another uh, group of stars over here which is known as a Krutika nakshatra or it is called as the Pleiades. Okay. 
So Pleiades is basically a group of seven stars that you see uh, uh, during a clear evening. So with the naked eyes, you are able to see typically six or seven stars. Okay. In the Japanese cultures, this constellation or this group of stars or an asterism is called as a Pleiades or Subaru. So Subaru is another uh, name for this particular asterism. Okay. And this Subaru or Pleiades is a part of the Taurus constellation. Okay. Now you can see a very beautiful uh, artwork. Uh, and the Taurus, uh, which, which was imagined as a bull, can be very uh, intuitively imagined so. So you can see this V shape, right? So I can switch off the constellation art and lines for Y. So if you look at this region, you will be able to see star number 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, right? So this is how the V appears in the sky. So right now if you go outside and if you look exactly overhead, you will be able to see this star. Uh, see, see this v-shape and on the one of the vertices or one of the ends of the v-shape there is this bright red star called Aldebaran okay so <clears throat> Aldebaran is basically a uh, Arabic name and it, it means a follower now what is happening is this Aldebaran is trying to follow Orion or Orion the hunter or it is basically trying to attack Orion the hunter so we are going to see the Orion's shape also now uh, I, I will leave the constellation lines and art on. So this constellation is called as Taurus the Bull and it has uh, the V shape that I told you is called as a Rohini Nakshatra. Okay. And during a clear sky at, at, on a darker side, you can see a lot many stars in this region. So this V shape is also known as a Hyades cluster and this is known as the Pleiades which is also a type of an open cluster. Okay. Or seven sisters in uh, popularly known as Subaru. Moving on, you can see that there, there is this very popular shape. So many a times whenever you go out for a sky watching session, you can easily spot these stars. You can spot a small quadrilateral, a small rectangle and in the center of that rectangle you can see three stars in a line. Okay, And their names are also very interesting. So some of these names might be uh, popular because of uh, Harry Potter. So you must have seen Betelgeuse. Uh, so this is the uh, bright red star or a red giant called Betelgeuse. So interesting fact that this Betelgeuse is uh, almost in its end stages of its life. So it is likely that Betelgeuse is going to die any time now. And when it dies, it will become a supernova. And in the morning sessions, we learned what, su what a supernova is. And it is possible that it will be extremely bright, bright enough to be seen even during daytime. So it will be brighter than the brightness of the sky during the daytime. So just like the crab pulsar that we saw in the morning, so uh, or the crab uh, supernova that we saw in the morning, uh, it is possible that during our lifetime we might be able to see a supernova explosion of Betelgeuse. This is another star on another shoulder of Orion called Bellatrix. This is a Harry Potter reference. Then you can also uh, see this star over here called Rigel and this star is Seth. So I'm just reading out the names. Uh, it is easier for you to uh, see the names because the stellarium helps you annotate the stars, right? And a very beautiful shape of a hunter has been imagined, right? So Orion the hunter is a very popular shape. And along with this hunter, there are his two dogs which keep on following him. So one of them is called as a Canis Major and one of them is called as Canis Minor. So these two are the dogs that keep on following the hunter, Orion the hunter. And this is basically lap, uh, Lipus or it is also called as Shashak in Marathi. This is called as a Mruga Nakshatra in Marathi. And this part or the head of the Orion is called as a Mruga Shirsha. Okay. And the star Betelgeuse is called as a Bharat or Takshi in Marathi. And the st star Raijan is known as Rajanyan. Now in, in in Indian mythology, this shape is imagined as a shape of a deer. Let's see how. So imagine that these four are the four legs of the deer. Okay, The deer is standing up and you are looking at the deer either from the top view or the bottom view. Okay, And then uh, these are the four feet or four legs of the deer. This is the head of the deer. And this these three stars are basically an arrow pierced within the stomach of the deer. And who has pierced this arrow? If you trace it back, 
it will go to this star over here. So this the name of this star is called as Sirius, and it is also called as a dog star because it is a part of the Canis Major constellation. But in Indian mythology, it is known as Vyad. So Vyad literally translates to shikari or a hunter, and this Vyad is trying to hunt this deer over here or the Mruga over here. So we saw Ashwini Nakshatra, then we saw Rohini Nakshatra, uh, we saw Mruga Shirsha Nakshatra, uh, and we saw the Orion the hunter as well as the shape, imagined the shape of a deer. Right? Now there is a very interesting object in the uh, Orion constellation and it is called the Orion's Nebula. So if I zoom in, you can find some of the youngest stars that we know uh, in the universe are being born in this region. Okay, so this area is very very rich in hydrogen and very rich in oxygen. So you can also see uh, right now this image uh, which has been attached over here is slightly overexposed but you can see a small trapezium uh, with your telescopes or even your binoculars uh, and you can easily spot this object. So this is the Orion's nebula. Nebula is nothing but a fuzzy or cloudy object and this is basically a stellar nursery where new stars are being born and because we are able to see many such stellar nurseries and also some stars which are older like Betelgeuse and we have so many stars to study, we are able to study about the life cycle of the stars uh, at the same time. So if you were given only two or three human beings and you were told to study the entire life cycle of the human beings, you would have to study those humans for a very long time right from the moment when they were born all the way until they grow old and eventually pass away. In case of a star, you have so many stars in the st uh, sky and everybody is in the different stages of their life. So it is similar to studying 2-3 thousand human beings at the same time where they will have different ages and they will be at different stages in life and you will be able to uh, understand how humans, are, how, how humans are born, how they evolve and how they die. So in case of a stars, uh, this constellation contains almost very very newly born stars as well as a star which is almost about to die and the Taurus constellation that we saw uh, it has a very very interesting object uh, about which we were talking early in the early morning so it has the crap nebula so uh, crab is basically a supernova remnant so it is whatever is remaining of that supernova so in the early morning uh, lectures we saw the crab nebula in different wavelengths and we were able to see different parts of crab nebula in different wavelengths right? and the sky is full of thousands and millions of such objects and they are just waiting to be explored they are just waiting to be photographed and now with the ease of uh, capturing the deep sky objects with your DSLR cameras even your cell phone cameras are now capable of capturing some beautiful photographs you can easily uh, capture these beautiful colorful images Note that the colors that you see here or even in the space telescopes images are applied later on. So any space telescope image which comes to us is monochrome or it, it, it is a grayscale image. So these colors that you see are added later on for our understanding. So which regions are rich in hydrogen, which regions are rich in oxygen, which regions are rich in sulfur is decided by the color code that we use. Okay. So and you can find hundreds and hundreds of such objects. In the sky and Stellarium is an excellent tool for doing a walkthrough of that. So this is basically the region of Orion and this also had has a very beautiful uh, region. This, so this is called as the Horsehead Nebula. Okay so we saw uh, about this nebula in the talk early in the morning. So this is an absorption nebula. This, this does not emit any light and we can see kind of a silhouette of uh, this horse head and then there is this flame nebula which is made out of dust filaments and then there is a lot of reflection in the dust so uh, coming from this star over here okay so the star light of this star is being reflected by the dust and then it is reaching us so it is very exciting to capture these uh, beautiful objects and then the sky is full of such dark and uh, absorption nebulas then it is also full of uh, emission and reflection nebulas and we already studied about that in the morning. So uh, the, the possibilities of creating these shapes is endless. So it's it's not at all compulsory that you have to follow the 
long uh, lasting tradition of the shapes that somebody had imagined hundreds of years ago so it is also possible for you to add your own shapes in this software right so you can create a library of your own shapes and you can uh, apply it to them so in this uh, there is also an option to change the star lore so right now i have selected western right so i can also select indian vedic star lore so when i do that the labels change right so in uh, indian star lore the uh, capella or the auriga constellation becomes the charioteer okay so now this software only has uh, popular shapes right and there are only those constellations have which are which are annotated which are also available in the uh, indian mythology so you can see all the zodiacal constellations have been uh, uh, marked on the ecliptic and then there are some other interesting constellations or asterisms which are a part of our folklore or different types of stories so i told you about the vyad right the deer hunter so this is basically the uh, hunter which is trying to kill the deer so this is the deer's head okay and <clears throat> the uh, vyad is trying to kill the deer and so this this is a very very interesting and very uh, powerful tool and it it allows you to literally move ahead and forward uh, and reverse in time and it, it it will help you simulate almost anything so you can also see the events that you might have missed if if there was a solar eclipse if there, if there was a venus transit then you can find out the date of date and time of that eclipse or the transit and then you can see those shapes so let's come back to the current date and time and uh, i will go back to the western star lore for now all right so uh, i would like to summarize all of this uh, in marathi now so uh, just a second I i'll just quickly check if there are any questions okay so nothing in particular so uh, moving up moving back सो आयुका मुक्तांगण विज्ञान शोधिका तर्फे सगळ्यांचं स्वागत आत्ता आपण आकाशदर्शनाचा जो कार्यक्रम पाहणार आहोत किंवा आपण जे आकाशदर्शन करणार आहोत त्याच्यामध्ये आपण काही राशी नक्षत्र आणि काही ग्रीक मायथोलॉजीप्रमाणे असलेले काही कॉन्स्टलेशन्स पाहणार सो आत्ता आपण आयुका गिरावली ऑब्झर्वेटरीमधनं जसं आकाश दिसेल तसं आकाश आत्ता पाहतोय कारण की आपण त्या गिरावली ऑब्झर्वेटरीचं लँडस्केप इथे लावलेलं आहे आणि असाच तुम्ही स्वतः तुमच्या घरच्या घरी असा फोटो काढून तो ते त्या फोटोस लँडस्केप स्टेलरियम मध्ये लावून तुम्ही हा प्रयोग किंवा ही ऍक्टिव्हिटी करू शकता आता आपण करंट डेट अँड टाईमला जर आलो तर आता वाजले सत्तावीस फेब्रुवारीचे संध्याकाळचे साडेसात आता आम्ही ह्या कॉन्स्टलेशनचे लाईन्स आणि लेबल्स ला ऑफ करून टाकतो तर आत्ता तुम्ही जर पश्चिमेकडे बघितलं तर पश्चिमेकडे बघितल्यानंतर तुम्हाला स्लाईटली दक्षिणेकडे आत्ता मगाशी सांगितल्याप्रमाणे हे मृग नक्षत्र दिसेल तर तुम्हाला मृगाचा हा आकार दिसेल की ज्याच्यामध्ये तुम्हाला हे चार ठळक तारे दिसतील आणि त्याच्या मध्यभागी तुम्हाला ह्या तीन ताऱ्यांची अशी रेष दिसेल या रेषेला ऍक्च्युली व्याधाने मारलेला बाण असं म्हणतात आणि हे मृग हा मृग नक्षत्राचा असा आकार आपल्याला बघता येतो त्यानंतर त्यानंतर इथे तुम्ही बरोबर डोक्यावरती पाहिलं तर तुम्हाला ह्या ताऱ्यांपासून बनलेला व्ही सारखा असा शेप दिसतो बरोबर तर त्यातला हा जो लाल रंगाचा तारा आहे ह्याचं नाव आहे रोहिणी आणि हा रोहिणी नक्षत्राचा मूळ तारा किंवा त्याचा ब्राईटेस्ट तारा आहे आणि हा सुद्धा रेड जायंट ना प्रकारचा तारा आहे सो ॲस्ट्रॉनॉमीमध्ये आपण जे तारे वस्तुमानाने खूप प्रचंड मोठे असतात त्यांना जायंट्स म्हणतो आणि ज्यांचं वस्तुमान आणि आकार खूप लहान असतो त्यांना आपण ड्वार्फ्स म्हणतो आणि त्यांच्या कलरप्रमाणे त्यांना लिटरली रेड जायंट ब्लू जायंट अशी नावं दिली जात दिली जातात आणि अल अल्दब्रान किंवा अल्डेब्रान म्हणजेच रोहिणी नक्षत्राचा मूळ तारा हा रेड जायंट स्वरूपाचा तारा आहे त्याचबरोबर इथे तुम्हाला ताऱ्यांचा एक छोटासा पुंजका दिसतोय त्या पुंजक्याला आपण रो कृतिका नक्षत्र असं म्हणतो आणि त्या कृतिका नक्षत्रामधले सहा मूळ तारे आपल्याला दिसतात किंवा सहा ठळक तारे आपल्याला साध्या डोळ्यांनी बघता येतात ठीक आहे तर त्या आता हा कृतिका नक्षत्राचा भाग त्याच्यानंतर रोहिणी नक्षत्राचा भाग आता तुम्हाला बाहेर जरी तुमच्याकडे आकाश जर क्लिअर असेल आणि तुम्ही जर आत्ता हा व्हिडिओ चालू असताना बाहेर जाऊन पाहिलं तर तुम्हाला हे आकाश अगदी असं दिसेल आणि तुम्ही जर थोडंसं उत्तरेकडे पाहिलं तर तुम्हाला हा एक ब्राईट तारा दिसेल ज्याचं नाव आहे कॅपेला की ज्याला आपण ब्रह्महृदय असंही म्हणतो आणि हे हे जे पाच तारे तुम्हाला दिसतात आता मी थोडं झूम करून दाखवतोय सो हे पाच तारे मिळून सारथी 
नावाचं एक नक्षत्र तयार होत तर सारथी म्हणजे घोडेस्वार किंवा जो घोडा चालवतो किंवा रथ चालवतो ऍक्च्युली सो सारथी नावाचं हे नक्षत्र आहे किंवा आपण तारका समूह म्हणूया आणि त्यातला हा कॅपेला नावाचा जो तारा आहे त्याला आपण मराठीमध्ये ब्रह्महृदय म्हणतो त्याचबरोबर हा जो एलनाथ नावाचा तारा तुम्हाला दिसतोय सो ह्याला आपण आपल्या इंडियन मायथोलॉजीमध्ये म्हणजे आपल्याच गोष्टींमध्ये ह्याला आपण अग्नी म्हणतो सो अग्नीची कृतिकांची आणि सप्तऋषींची अशी एक गोष्ट आहे सो त्याचबरोबर इथनं इथनं जर आपण थोडस पुढे आलो तर तुम्हाला इथे असा एक पॅरेलोग्राम दिसतो ठीक आहे सो एक स्टार नंबर एक स्टार नंबर दोन स्टार नंबर तीन आणि चार असं तुम्हाला लाईक पॅरलोग्राम दिसतोय ह्याला स्वर्गाचे प्रवेशद्वार किंवा गेट वे ऑफ हेवन असं आपण म्हणतो त्याचं कारण असं आहे की ही जी इक्लिप्टिकची लाईन आहे ती इक्लिप्टिकची लाईन ह्या दोन बेसिकली चार ताऱ्यांच्या मधनं पास होती आणि आपल्या सौरमालेतले सगळेच ग्रह हे त्या इक्लिप्टिकच्या लाईनच्या जवळपासून प्रवास करतात कारण की आपल्या सोलर सिस्टीमचं किंवा आपल्या सौरमालेचं जे प्रतल आहे किंवा जे प्लेन आहे ते प्लेन ह्या इक्लिप्टिक पेक्षपासनं खूप ऑफ नाही आहे त्यामुळे योगायोगाने जेव्हा प्ला राधर जेव्हा सौरमाला तयार होत होती तर तेव्हा सौरमाला तयार होत असताना सूर्य तयार सूर्य आणि प्लॅनेट्स हे साधारणपणे एकाच वेळी तयार झाले होते आणि हे तयार झाले ते गॅसचं अकुंचन झाल्यापासून आणि गॅस आणि डस्टचं बेसिकली अकुंचन व्हायला लागलं आणि त्याच्यापासून प्रोटोप्लॅनेटरी डिस्क तयार झाली आणि हळूहळू प्लॅनेट्स फॉर्म व्हायला लागले त्याचबरोबर सूर्य आणखीन आणखीन फ्युजन होऊन आणखीन ब्राईट होत होत गेला सो बेसिकली आपल्या सोलर सिस्टीमचे सगळ्या प्लॅनेट्सचे ऑर्बिट्स ह्या ह्या दोन ताऱ्यांच्या मधनं पास होतात आणि आपल्याला पृथ्वीवरनं पाहताना ह्या दोन ताऱ्यांच्या मधनं सगळे प्लॅनेट्स मून आणि सन हे कधी ना कधीतरी पास होताना दिसतात म्हणून आपण त्याला स्वर्गाचं प्रवेशद्वार असं किंवा गेट वे ऑफ हेवन असं म्हणतो आता तुम्हाला या सॉफ्टवेअरमध्ये बऱ्याचदा असे हळणारे डॉट्स दिसतात सो ह्या ॲक्च्युली सॅटेलाईट्स आहेत आणि आपल्याला ऍक्च्युली तुम्ही जर बाहेर जाऊन आकाशात बघितलं तर तुम्हाला ह्या सॅटेलाईट्स हलताना दिसू शकतात सो सूर्यास्तानंतर काही तास म्हणजे दोन ते तीन तास आणि सूर्योदयाच्या आधीचे दोन ते तीन तास जर तुम्ही आकाशात गेलात तर तुम्हाला ह्या सॅटेलाईट्स दिसू शकतात आणि ह्या सॅटेलाईट्स ह्या मानव निगडीत आता ह्या सॅटेलाईटचं नाव तुम्हाला इथे दिसतं ही स्टारलिंक वन झिरो एट नाईन नंबरची सॅटेलाईट आहे सो आजच आपण स्टारलिंक बद्दल खूप बोललो तर ही अशीच एक स्टारलिंक सॅटेलाईट पास होताना तुम्हाला पाहता येऊ शकते त्याचबरोबर आपलं इंटरनॅशनल स्पेस स्टेशन म्हणून आहे की जी आपले अवकाशातली एक ऑब्झर्वेटरी आपली आहे आणि पाच देशांची मिळून अशी ती ऑब्झर्वेटरी आहे आणि त्याचा सुद्धा पास तुम्हाला स्काय बंद आधीपासूनच प्रेडिक्ट करता येतो आणि ती माहिती घेऊन तुम्ही तो सॅटेलाईटचा पास नक्की बघू शकता सो तुम्ही आकाशात जेव्हा जाता तेव्हा साध्या डोळ्यांनी आकाश दर्शन करण्यासारख्या गोष्टी अनेक असतात आता तुम्हाला इथे जर तुम्ही पाहिलं तर तुम्हाला इथे असा ताऱ्यांचा असा पट्टा दिसतो सो so, हा ताऱ्यांचा जो पट्टा आहे हा आपल्याच दीर्घिकेचा म्हणजे मिल्की वे गॅलेक्सीचा स्पार्ट आहे तर ह्याला विंटर मिल्की वे म्हणतो आपण कारण का हा पट्टा फक्त विंटर्समध्येच आपल्याला दिसतो सो so, आत्ता हा विंटर मिल्की वेचा पार्ट अल्डेब्रान वगैरेपासून सुरू होऊन नंतर मग बेटल ग्यूज ओरायन त्याच्यानंतर अशा सगळे कॉन्स्टलेशन्स म्हणून पास होताना तुम्हाला दिसतो पण विंटर मिल्की वे तुम्हाला जर पाहिजे असेल तर त्यासाठी तुम्हाला खूप क्लिअर आणि डार्क स्कायला जाणं गरजेचं आहे त्याचबरोबर इथे तुम्हाला एक खूप इंटरेस्टिंग ऑब्जेक्ट दिसत आहे सो ह्या ऑब्जेक्टला मी आता जर सेंटर करून झूम केलं तर तुम्हाला आता इथे गॅलेक्सी दिसते सो ही आहे अँड्रोमेडा गॅलेक्सी किंवा ह्याला आपण देवयानी दीर्घिका असं म्हणतो आणि ह्या देवयानी दीर्घिका किंवा देवयानी गॅलेक्सी मध्ये आपली गॅलेक्सी ही कोलाईड होणार आहे सो आत्तापासून साधारणपणे चार ते पाच अब्ज वर्षांमध्ये आपली दीर्घिका म्हणजे मिल्की वे किंवा आकाशगंगा आणि देवयानी म्हणजेच अँड्रोमेडा ह्या एकमेकांमध्ये मर्ज होणार आहेत आणि त्या दोन्ही मिळून एक कंबाईंड गॅलेक्सी तयार होणार आहे सो अशी अशी ही हा सुद्धा खूप सुंदर ऑब्जेक्ट आहे हा तुम्ही बायनॉक्युलरने बघू शकता आणि तुम्हाला साध्या डोळ्यांनी सुद्धा ही गॅलेक्सी आत्ता जशी दिसते या व्ह्यूला तशा प्रकारे स्पॉट करता येऊ शकते आणि त्याचबरोबर तुम्ही जर थोडी प्रॅक्टिस केली तर तुम्ही याचे फोटोग्राफी सुद्धा करू शकता आता ह्या सॉफ्टवेअरमधनं तुम्हाला काही स्क्रिप्ट पण रन करता येतात तर आता आपण एखादी एक स्क्रिप्ट रन करू 
आणि नंतर मग आपलं सेशन कन्क्लूड करू अच्छा अल अल सो ही स्क्रिप्ट आपण रन करू आणि त्यानंतर मग आपलं सेशन आपण कन्क्लूड करू शकतो आपण एखादी सोलार इक्लिप्सची हे पाहूया इन्स्टन्स पाहूया सो जेव्हा सोलार इक्लिप्स होतो तेव्हा एक्झॅक्टली काय काय ॲक्टिव्हिटीज आपल्याला बघता येतात तर हे आपण पाहूया तर त्यासाठी मी आधी सगळे मार्किंग्स ऑफ करतो आणि अशा तुम्हाला तुमच्या आपापल्या स्वतःच्या स्क्रिप्ट सुद्धा बघता येऊ शकतात आता आपण बघणार आहोत की सोलार इक दोन हजार नऊ साली बांगलादेशच्या इथनं दिसलेला जो सोलार इक्लिप्स होता तो कसा दिसला होता आता तुम्ही बघताय की डेट आणि टाइम अपॉप चेंज झाली आहे स्काय आता फास्ट फॉरवर्ड होत आहे टाइम फास्ट फॉरवर्ड होतोय पहाटेचे चार वाजलेत ते वरती तुम्हाला डेट आणि टाइम आणि लोकेशन दिसलं होतं आता मी ऍक्च्युली हे सॉफ्टवेअर ऑपरेट करत नाही आहे आपण स्क्रिप्ट रन केली आहे की जी स्क्रिप्ट ह्या सॉफ्टवेअरला समजणाऱ्या भाषेत म्हणजे स्टेलेरियमच्या स्क्रिप्टिंग लँग्वेजमध्ये लिहिली गेली so this is actually a simulation of the solar proto uh, solar eclipse from bangladesh which is in the rangpur and uh, what what we are trying to simulate here is uh, basically how the uh, total solar eclipse occurs you can see that after a while the uh, sky will start to darken and the brighter stars and planets will start to be visible so as the uh, moon starts to completely cover the sun you can see that some bright stars will start to appear for a very small while take a look now we are almost close to the totality i think this is uh, the beauty of this application it is when some very rare events happen so you don't miss out on them you can just go back in time and you can watch any uh, celestial event happen and you can simulate that event right whenever you want so even if the eclipse is going to happen in antarctica it's if it is going to happen in the arctic circle and it is not very easy to go there so you can simply click uh, a location on the map and there you are so that was it that was the overall uh, simulation of the solar eclipse I, i will need to restart the stellarium application now so uh, that was about the sky show and uh, now i think uh, we will need to uh, uh, address a question a couple of questions when you uh, uh, which which were you have so if if you want uh, i can uh, set a particular uh, you know time and date and some event and location so if you have any questions please please feel free to ask me in the chat and i will be happy to answer them so even if you have all if, if you have any other questions so we will definitely try to answer them so the software that i demonstrated here uh, the name of that software is stellarium and it is a free software and it is available on all platforms and uh, the So, uh, whatever views that i showed were not real but they were real time so they were simulated versions so you often see something like this even in a planetarium so if you go to mumbai if you go to kolkata so there are many planetariums that are coming up now and uh, you can easily simulate these different types of uh, events and different types of uh, views uh, in, in a software right so uh, coming back to stellarium let let me just switch back the view I know the stellarium is slightly too dark now. 
I can move ahead in time. It's almost daytime now and it's 28th of February. So we are back to the Ayuka location. We were in the Giravali Observatory location right now, but we are back to, uh, back to the Ayuka campus. Now there are some more interesting things in Stellarium. So uh, you can, like I said, you can change the different star loads and then there are different scripts that you can run from the Stellarium. So there is a script for, uh, you know, all the uh, supernova, supernovas that we know. Then there is a script about transit of Venus. Then there is a script about constellations and also the zodiacal constellations. So I think uh, I will run the script of zodiacal constellations. I will talk a little bit more about it and then we can conclude the session. We wanted to really show you the live views of the telescope, uh, but the sky isn't permitting us today. But I'm sure I, I, I will uh, assure you that we will come back with a live sky session. And if possible, we will be very, very happy for you to be here at Ayuka and we will be more than happy to set up as many telescopes as we have to show you all the objects live through the telescope feed. Uh, what you see here is the script that is running. Uh, you can see that the orange line is basically the ecliptic that we talked about. So it is the apparent path of the sun. Now along this ecliptic line you can see these different shapes. So there is Aries, then there is Taurus, then there is Gemini, then there is Cancer, then there is Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius and Pisces. But notice that there is another constellation over here, right? So you all, you all always have heard about 12 zodiacal constellations or 12, 12 sun signs. So why, why, why is this another one over here? So it was identified as a zodiacal constellation a, a while back. And this constellation is called as the Ophiuchus. Okay. And do you notice the red colored boundaries over here? So these were the boundaries I was talking about. So whenever there, is, there are some common stars which are there in some constellation like for example the star called Elnath was common to Auriga and it was common to Taurus but because of this boundary over here the star Elnath has now be become a part of Taurus constellation. So it is very very important to uh, set up these boundaries of constellations so that it becomes easy for astronomers to communicate. So if I want to tell you something, uh, to tell you to look at some uh, you know it, important or particular location, I will need to uh, tell you the exact address of that location, right? And that address, address needs to be unique and it should be common to both of us, right? So if I say that uh, the brightest star in the Taurus constellation needs to be uh, selected, then I, you and I should both be looking at this very star, okay? And a brightest star is often termed as an alpha of of a particular constellation, the second brightest is beta and so on. So there is a lot of uh, details about how stars are named, how uh, constellations are identified and how the boundaries are made. But long story short, these boundaries are done in order to uh, classify the stars to the respective constellations. Okay, And you can see that these beautiful shapes are part of the different types of star lores that exist. And this is the reason uh, why we call these constellations as zodiacal constellations because they are all along the ecliptic. So uh, that was all about the sky session. Uh, we will we will come back to you with a telescope session uh, so at some point in, later in time, whenever the sky permits. So if you have any more questions, you can please feel free to ask us. If not, we can uh, conclude the session. So I will come to some questions. So can Stellarium be used? To control computerized go-to telescopes so it depends if your telescope controller is going to support that so stellarium is a highly customizable software so if you have the drivers for your telescope so and if the drivers can communicate to stellarium then it is very much possible you can also use stellarium pro version or stellarium mobile version to uh, show or to operate a uh, telescope and that is very much possible nowadays people are uh, able to build telescopes using simple small computers called Raspberry Pis and uh, even controllers like Arduino and it, it really is very interesting to uh, design a working uh, tracking go-to telescope from scratch 
and get to operate it from a software as simple as Telerium. So thank you all for patiently listening and for joining the Ayuka Science Day stream all around the day. I know it was an eventful day. You had to, uh, you know, go through too many lectures, too many uh, demonstrations. You, you also got to see the walkthrough. Uh, in the end, before I conclude, let me remind you that uh, we have all these resources available on our YouTube channel, Facebook, as well as the Twitter page uh, that we have. So our Twitter, Facebook, as well as YouTube handles. So since uh, we are streaming this live, I'm sure you all already are uh, subscribing our YouTube, Facebook, as well as Twitter channels. So the name of the software is Stellarium. Uh, I will quickly repeat. The name of the software is Stellarium. And many of you are asking, how can we change the landscape in Stellarium? So if you simply go to the Stellarium official website, you can find all the instructions and all the notes uh, on how to create your own landscape. And I think that will be a very good exercise and a very good uh, homework. And if you, if you feel that you are not able to do that, you can always write to us. Uh, you will find our email IDs as well on the Science Day website. And uh, feel free to write to us, get back to us, and we will be happy to help. So until then, uh, see you all, wish you all a very happy science day. Tomorrow we, will, we are going to uh, arrange a session where we will be announcing the winners of the National Science Day uh, competitions uh, of both rural as well as urban schools. And there will be a post which will be explaining the detailed time as well as the link to join that. So we would love for you to please join that session and encourage the students who are winners of the national science day competitions uh, in both rural as well as the urban areas so ayuka conducts uh, annual quiz uh, essay drawing as well as uh, uh, poetry competition every year and this year we have uh, identified the winners and tomorrow we will announce them and we also have uh, our partners uh, ligo india which are uh, of our fellow uh, outreach team members in ayuka they will be conducting a couple of sessions tomorrow so make sure you uh, give a look. So thank you all for joining and see you. Wish you all a happy science day.